Why SpaceX won the human landing system contract? What's left in SN15's test campaign and when it will be ready for its first test flight? How will SN20 look? I'll answer this and many other questions in the next episode of Starship Updates. We'll start with the most important and the most surprising news of this week, which was NASA selecting SpaceX as the only company to continue developing their lunar lander for the Human Landing System program, which in the future will be used in the Artemis program. It should allow humanity to return back to the moon. It's quite a surprising choice, especially that the main competitor was Blue Origin's national team, which as we know consists of companies that have really good relationship with Congress. At first, NASA was supposed to choose two companies to continue the lander development, but budget cuts made that only SpaceX was able to fit within the budget after slightly optimizing the cost. The price offered by Elon Musk was exactly $2,941,394,557. It might sound like a lot, but the document released by NASA states that between SpaceX's offer and Blue Origins was a wide price gap. Additionally, SpaceX showed that the Starship indeed flies and sometimes even lands. They've also supposedly shown the mock-up of their Lunar Starship Elevator, where Dynetics and Blue Origin only had a simple mock-up without any significant working technology. When it comes to Dynetics, their lander looked pretty solid in the technological and reusability aspects. However, in the document we can read that they've already had a negative mass and you can forget about spare room for anything extra. This basically means that their lander was just too heavy and they've had no idea how to cut the weight. Additionally, it was way more expensive than even the national team's proposal. On the other hand, we have Blue Origin, which proposed lander looked and functioned like something from Apollo times with almost zero reusability. This, combined with the low budget of the Artemis program, could end up in the program's cancellation. Also, it looks like Jeff Bezos' company wanted to test some of its systems during the final landing, which, as you can imagine, isn't the greatest idea, especially when the first landing should occur in 2024. What's even worse is that probably someone at Blue Origin got fired because they must have not read the instructions when sending the proposal for NASA approval. The HLS program specifically stated that you can't request to be paid in advance and that was exactly what their proposal was based on, which could disqualify them right at the beginning. So yeah, that's roughly how every company's idea of Lunar Lander looks, but let's get back to SpaceX. During the press conference, there was something that almost proved that SpaceX has won. It was the new Lunar Starship render. As you can see, quite a lot has been changed. Firstly, it looks like the number of windows was reduced and the photovoltaic panels were moved to the lower section of the nose cone. Additionally, the airlock door mechanism has changed, but the elevator remained almost the same. Also, I should notice that this lander will have two completely separate airlocks, which is something new on this type of vehicle, of course excluding space stations. Next up, we have a pretty significant change. Beforehand, there were three engines on each side of the Starship, and now it seems that they've decided to put a lot of Super Draco Tribe thrusters in a ring. I'm really interested in knowing which fuel will be used to power these. Lastly, we have another huge change. The landing legs are now way bigger, and they use a completely different mechanism from the one used in prototypes right now. We'll see if SpaceX will be able to meet the deadline, but if so, then we are looking forward to a really exciting next 4 years. Before we continue, don't forget to subscribe, drop a like and leave your opinion in the comments. A huge portion of you isn't subscribed, so please let's help improve the statistic. This really helps me to get motivated to create more and more Starship update videos. Anyway, back to the video. For now, let's stay on Earth. I've answered this question a couple of times before, but it's still repeating, so I might as well address it in this video. Why SN12, 13 and 14 were skipped? As you can see from Brandon's chart, the SN12 was almost ready and SN13 and 14 were getting their first parts. Because the SN8 flight went so well, SpaceX was able to test almost everything that they've planned for this generation, including good ascent phase, switching to header tanks, belly flop maneuver, and landing on the pad. 
Well, maybe not in one piece, but at least in the right place. Then it turned out that the autogenous pressurization wasn't working as expected, but SN9, 10 and 11 were almost finished, so they've decided to go with a temporary solution, which was a COPV field with helium. This solution also had its problems, but still, the problem with pressure was a result of faulty Raptor engines, not the prototype itself, so it just didn't make any sense to test the exact same prototype again and again, and that's why they skipped a bunch of prototypes to go straight to SN15. Also, remember that these generation prototypes weren't meant to land at all, so please stop posting comments stating that it was another SpaceX's failure. Also, comparing Starship Explosion with the safety of Falcon 9 is irrational. Now, let's take a closer look at the first generation prototype with serial number 15. As of now, the prototype went through one pressure test using nitrogen in the ambient temperature, Next, SpaceX conducted two cryo tests using liquid nitrogen. The first one was testing the main tanks and the second one tested the header tanks. It looks like the tests were successful because the thrust simulator was dismounted to be replaced with the Raptor engines which arrived in Boca Chica two days later. Raptors SN61 and 66 were mounted in a record-breaking time of an hour for each. What's interesting is that SN54 went back where it came from to go back again to Boca Chica the day later. Right now, SN15 has all of her three engines mounted and it's waiting for a static fire. It's kinda surprising that SpaceX used brand new Raptors when from Carter's photo we can figure out that they have at least six engines just sitting in the production facility. It's possible though that they will be used in one of Super Heavy prototypes. Elon tweeted that SN15's flight should occur later this week, but unfortunately Elon's favorite date, which is 420, isn't possible. Right now, it doesn't look too good. All temporary flight restrictions for Boca Chica were withdrawn and the closure for April the 20th was cancelled. We're not sure what led to the cancellation of the closure, but the TFRs were probably withdrawn because the FAA still hasn't finished the SN11 investigation and it needs to end before they will give a green light for SN11. 15. I don't think that it will fly this week, but who knows what will happen. Between SN15's tests, the workers added a few additional heat tiles to the prototype surface. If you are a perfectionist, then better close your eyes. Right now, the tiles were added twice, and I hope that this gap will be filled before the flight because it really hurts my eyes. Speaking of heat tiles, in this photo you can see an enormous amount of them. It's a section of the prototype with the number 16. SpaceX is getting close to the final Starship look, which should be fully covered with heat ties on the one half. Additionally, it looks like the SN16 stacking process has begun in the midbay. It's incredible how fast piece their progress is. The last piece of information regarding Starship's second stage is the common section for SN20, captured by Mary the Boca Chica Gal. This picture suggests that SN20 won't be fully covered in heat tiles, but it turns out that SN15 had the exact same label, so this probably doesn't represent the final state of this prototype. As a quick note, when I was recording this, the GSC-2 tank was transported from the production facility and mounted near the orbital launch pad. We're expecting to see five more identical tanks. Ok ok, but as we know the Starship second stage needs to somehow get to the orbit, so let's take a look at the Super Heavy Booster Progress update. What you see on the pictures right now is the process of dismantling the aforementioned booster. The inside sources said that BN1 will conduct a cryo test and maybe even a static fire, but in the end it turned out that it was just a pathfinder, so there's no need to waste time on tests when the next one's design changed quite a bit. So unfortunately PN1 was scrapped. But that's not all info regarding Super Heavy. What you see on your screen right now is the first complete Super Heavy grid fin used to control the vehicle during the landing phase. It's absolutely huge and I can't wait to see one mounted on one of the prototypes. Lastly, let's take a look at the prototype update chart created by Brendan Lewis. As you can see, from the last week the SN16's common section was mated with the rest of the tank section, SN20 also received the common section and the thrust section of BN2 was just finished. That's all I've got for you in today's episode of Starship Updates. If you liked this video, then don't forget to leave a like, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.